We continue analyzing the Ravens' 24-22 loss to the Cleveland Browns in Week 14 with a very special guest next year on Locked On Ravens. You are Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we return here with another episode of Locked On Ravens. I'm your host, Kevin Ostreicher of Ravens Wire. And here with me today, of course, as it is Taco Tuesday to break down, unfortunately, another Ravens loss. This time to the Cleveland Browns in week 14, 24 to 22 is Spencer Schultz of Baltimore. Beat down Spencer. The Ravens stand at 8-5 and five now, still at the top of the AFC North. But it doesn't really feel that way in some degree. How are you doing today? Doing quite well. You're absolutely right. It kind of feels like the AFC North is like the new NFC East this year. It's like nobody wants to win it. No one can take true command of it. But the Ravens have kind of been sitting there for a while and the Bengals weren't able to pull one out. And the Steelers, you know, kind of fell short on Thursday night after a big comeback. And the Ravens are still sitting on top. So they still control their own destiny despite the trouble that they've had over the last month or two. And uh, it's just funny because you would think this was a five and eight team, the way that narratives are, are flipped on them and the way that people talk about them. But this is the first time they've actually had a losing streak this year. And it's just two games and they uh, continue to fight hard and play through the end of the fourth quarter and give every single team they play a run for their money at some point or another, especially late on. So it's been a fun ride, a, a lot of fun games and yet another one here. I know it, it, it's been a crazy ride, all things considered, with the injuries, the close games, the heartbreaking finishes. I mean, it's been one wacky season and it's only going to continue here over the course of this next month. But Spencer, talking about this game here, 24-22 to Cleveland, it was a game. It really was a tale of two halves. We'll talk about the defense a bit in the second segment. But Baltimore's offense, obviously, they lose Lamar Jackson to the ankle injury pretty early in this game. Ends up getting, you know, carded, if you want to call it that, back to the locker room and then ends up being ruled out for the remainder of the game. So Tyler Huntley comes up off the bench, performs decently well, all things considered. I was impressed with how he handled himself, you know, had a few miscues, but all things considered, I think he once again showed that he was the man for the job of backing up Jackson and leading this team. If Jackson has to miss time for any reason whatsoever, you see the Ravens go one of 12 or one for 12 on third down, not, Amazing. It's just over 8%. Not what you want to see there. The run game, Devonta Freeman looks like the bell cow. Now in this offense, you have Rashad Bateman showing up big in this one. You have Mark Andrews, but just coming up a bit short as they couldn't muster a ton in the first half and, you know, couldn't really do just enough to win in the second. So Spencer, what was your overall thought of this offense, Lamar Jackson's injury, Tyler Huntley and everything else? Yeah, it was a slow start. They've had slow starts time and time again. Lamar Jackson hits a pretty big scramble at one point, and it gets negated by a holding penalty on Alejandro Villanueva, who has committed 10 offensive penalties to this point. I think that over the last two games, it's been a little bit overlooked, the fact that the Ravens have committed 15 offensive penalties just on that side of the football in two divisional games. And there's the easy branch of that, which is to say, you know, you got Phillips, you got Villanueva in there, you got uh, some young players, you got Tomlinson out there, you know, some guys that you didn't really imagine having, but at some point, uh, they, you know, some of them are ticky tacky, whatever, but it's too many. Um, they're forced to have a quarterback draw on a third down early on in the game because they were not urgent enough getting to the line of scrimmage. And at some point, you know, I, number one, I think there's a lot of, of finger pointing to Greg Roman. There has been always and forever. If you go to a Baltimore Ravens Instagram post and look at the comments, there's like thousands of comments, fire Greg Roman, fire Greg Roman. Uh, I've talked about that on this podcast and on all my platforms about how that's a little bit uh, misconstrued, but if you want to point the finger somewhere at coaches and Greg Roman, you know, they, they got to figure out a way to cut down on penalties. Uh, at the same time, the players are professionals, man. They're getting paid millions of dollars and they're not hustling to the line of scrimmage. Uh, Lamar Jackson can be a little bit too casual getting to the line of scrimmage at times as well. So those penalties really bit the Ravens in the butt time and time again, putting themselves in second and twenties and first and thirties and negating big plays that they have. And, uh, things of that nature, the grand irony of the play where Jeremiah wusu uh dives at Lamar Jackson's ankles really late, which I thought should have been a penalty, but they end up having a somewhat successful play. 
following a penalty. So it's second and 15. They run a tight end screen to Mark Andrews. Ends up being a 10-yard gain to put them in third and manageable. And it's negated by a penalty. And, and Lamar Jackson's hurt there. So uh, just, just sloppy all around. But the Ravens' pass-catching talent late in the game is able to show out for Tyler Huntley. Uh, one of my favorite plays of this entire season covering the Ravens is Mark Andrews. Uh, breaking four tackles and carrying Browns defenders 25 yards downfield when they're trailing 24 to six, showing that he, the highest paid player on that offense really is not going to back down at any given point. He's going to give hundred percent effort and he's going to do everything he can to win the game. So uh, I think that, and guys like Marquise Brown and Rashad Bateman continuing to answer the bell. Devonte Freeman's been really nice this year as well. Uh, stood tall for Tyler Huntley and you go look at the end of the first half, you know, a team that's down 24 to three. Well, they find themselves back in their own territory and they string out a field goal, which ends up being you know, nearly being one of the aspects that won them that game. Then tempo took over. And at this point, you know, we saw tempo a lot earlier and more often than we have really at any point this season. Uh, the script did kind of force that a little bit, but still they stuck with it. And you have to have to listen to the comments that Lamar Jackson's made. You have to listen to, uh, the, the results there and the results are that the Ravens need to continue to go tempo. And you mentioned Kevin, that they were one for 12 on third down. Well, Tyler Huntley started out four for four on fourth down. He had the most fourth down conversions of any quarterback in a game this season. I believe I saw Jamison Hensley of ESPN say, and uh, you know, they had to have some confidence that they were going to be able to go get it on that, uh, that fourth down there. And ultimately, you know, everybody's up in arms over the fourth down play. The Browns did what everybody has done to the Ravens dating back to the Miami Dolphins back in, I guess, week eight, nine. I think that was week nine, maybe. And that's that's try and pressure it, get a pressure situation going um, earlier on fourth and six earlier on with about a minute and 37. when the score is 24 to 15. The Ravens opted to try and hit a go ball. This time they ran a two man concept, which was kind of like a smash with Rashad Bateman being the hot route. We see uh, Tyler Huntley post game say that, you know, his hot read was Bateman. He saw the free rusher and that was the built in hot read. And then everybody gets it up in arms. Why are you throwing a slant? Why are you throwing short of the sticks? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And the irony of that is when everybody likes to reference these, you know, the, the, the Twitter sphere likes to reference, oh, well, Steve Smith and Dan Orlovsky and Kurt Warner have all made these videos saying, you know, where's the hot read? That was the hot read. That was the built-in, you know, winner. That was the blitz beater. And guess what? The number four overall pick, an all-pro caliber player, makes a massive play there. And frankly, you know, Tyler Huntley played outstanding in this game, considering the situation, considering you know his his stock and and what's kind of been the situation this year, but uh, and, and everything involved with him. But he missed a couple opportunities to Hollywood Brown. The Ravens, you know, uh, try to dial up some deep shots and score a little bit earlier and give themselves a chance and. Uh, he, he can't connect with Marquise Brown when he's streaking down the field a couple times. But, you know, the third and 20, they find themselves in after taking sacks and doing some things, have a big play to Mark Andrews. And then Denzel Ward made a play, man. And it feels like there's some sort of backlash to the fact that people, you know, the people who cover and, and do video content and everything are saying, oh, well, the other team executed. Well, they get paid too, man. And the Ravens have won a lot of close games this year. They had five fourth quarter comebacks that they won. They rattled wins off against the Chiefs and the Colts and the Vikings and all these different teams. But at the end of the day, you know, they they have struggled as of late. So it's the other side of the sword. So it's like, oh, well, at some point you have to blame the the offensive coordinator that, you know, the, that the plays haven't worked. It's like the grand irony of it for me is that when you go back to the early success, Lamar Jackson throwing for 440 yards against the Colts and on pace for 5,000 yards, uh, it's everyone singing the songs of T. Martin and Keith Williams. And then whenever there's struggles, it's Greg Roman. So uh, I just think there's a little bit of hypocrisy there. And, uh, you know, Greg Roman, not a great pass game coordinator, but down 24 to three, your backup quarterbacks in, you probably have the worst starting tackle combination in the NFL right now in Villanueva and Phillips. And the Ravens went tempo, dialed it up. Uh, dotted up time after time. Tyler Huntley, shout out to him. He made plays, made plays with his legs, made plays with his arm, got the ball out early and often. Uh, he also did fumble a ball where he's carrying it like a loaf of bread down in the red zone and also got strip sacked with having some poor ball security as well. So uh, I think that Ravens offense, you know, did a nice job, especially in that second half and starting with the, the final drive of the first half and to go have Justin Tucker kick a field goal, but it's too little too late and they, they couldn't quite pull it off. So it's, it's very disappointing. It's upsetting, but uh, it's the nature of what's going on. I mean, Lamar Jackson goes down. Everything goes wrong. You're missing all these all pros, all these high paid players, all your highest paid players, your most talented players. And I think it just really speaks to the strength of this coaching staff. 
and not being able to give up. And it felt like this is probably, you know, oh, they're down 24 to three or 17 to three or whatever it is. And uh, it feels like, oh, well, this might be the game where they finally just go belly up and uh, get absolutely blown out. And then everybody, you know, the, 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 the cries for fires and this and that, and everybody's old, old drafts that they've had saved up on what they thought a long time ago and have been waiting to say and, and waiting for this and waiting for that. Uh, it, it didn't pan out that way. They played a great game in the second half in the fourth quarter and put themselves in a position to win. They've put themselves in a position to win every single game this year. Even the Miami Dolphins game, you know, it was decided in the final couple minutes of the game. So uh, I, I think that speaks when you got 20 guys on IR, your quarterback's not in the game, your MVP, you know, franchise quarterback's not in the game. And you're still able to uh, keep the gloves on and keep punching and punching and punching until the clock strikes zero. So I was very impressed overall with the Ravens moxie in this game. They made mistakes. They commit too many penalties. Um, they got away from the run game maybe a couple times and uh, things of that nature. But I, I still came away impressed considering how ugly it was in the first half that they were yet again able to dig themselves out of that hole. And of course, you want to see them start faster and you want to see them blow the other team out and win easily. And every fan wants you know their team to go 20-0 and 0 ultimately, but that's just not the nature of the beast. So uh, the NFL is... Hard, surprise, surprise, hard to win, hard to win games, but the Ravens still control their own destiny. They're eight and five. We'll see what happens with Lamar Jackson, but they've got two huge divisional games coming up here down the stretch, and that's going to decide this division in all likelihood. Yeah, Baltimore has to win their last two divisional games. I think that's big for them to do so, especially with the way the AFC North is. You kind of talked about no one wants to really take hold of it and grab it right now, so the Ravens still on top, but they'll have to perform well over you know the next two divisional games, which come in a couple weeks for them. But Spencer, these Ravens games don't come without their fair share of, I guess, controversy, as I'll call it. Is Baltimore is scoring a touchdown, is down by nine points with about nine minutes to go in the fourth quarter, and instead of kicking the extra point to make it a one-possession game at eight points John Harbaugh elects to go for two to make it a seven point game now Harbaugh kind of explained his decision talking about well you kind of want to know where you are earlier because if you kick the extra point you're down eight you don't convert on the two point conversion if you score again then you know the game's over at that point he said so did you agree with his decision Spencer to go for two there try to make it a seven point game ultimately they fail it's still a nine point game so it's two possessions I mean, the end result, they still had the ball with a chance to win the game. So it was no harm, no foul really at the end. But what are your thoughts on that decision? Well, coming off a game where, you know, they try to go for two last week to win the game and they're not able to get it. And then again, they go for two in this one and they're not able to get it. I think Lamar Jackson is like three of they're three of 12 on two point conversions in the last two years or something like that. Uh, they uh, you, you can argue about it. I, I don't I don't really understand trying to argue that they should delay. It's like. Do you want to go to jail now or do you want to go to jail later? Do you want to, you know, pay your taxes now or pay your taxes later? It's like you should get it over with. That's part of being an adult and being responsible is to get the, you know, the task out of the way to do what you're supposed to do. And in that case, it's trying to understand if you're going to have to go for two or have to score how many possessions you're going to have to have earlier versus later. So uh, if you want to kick the can down the road, that's fine. But ultimately, either way, you're going to have to convert a two-point conversion at some point, and that's where they need to be better. They have not ran the ball or handed the ball off to a running back in I don't know how long. Uh, it feels like you could very easily use quarterbacks as a distraction, and I think that's an area where Greg Roman has struggled in terms of uh, everybody knows you know, Lamar Jackson is going to be the one with the ball in his hands to win the game, and you want that to be the case, but – it's every single time. It's never a handoff. It's never something that kind of takes the ball out of his hands or, you know, a reverse or a jet sweep or a trick play, you know, Statue of Liberty, Philly, Philly, whatever it is. Uh, so I, I think they need to be better in terms of actually converting those. But I, 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 there's all these arguments and all of them are just so silly to me. It's like, oh, well, you're taking momentum away from the team. It's like, are you sure? Because they were down 24 to three. They didn't get it, held the Browns two more times and then scored again. So the momentum aspect, I, I don't really know where that's that's the fall off there. And then, like you said, Kevin, they had the ball with a chance to win. So that's what they wanted. And they were going to have to do that at some point. They're not playing to tie. They're playing to win. John Harbaugh doesn't play to tie. He plays to win. And everybody's mocking like analytics and all these things. But it's like, oh, OK, you, you, you're you really excited to try to have to score twice, including a two point conversion late in the game where you tie then and send the game to overtime yet again when you're down to these players yet again you're on the road everybody you know it's all these different factors but I, I just don't understand the huge 
the huge what to do about it. That's not what lost the game. What lost the game was the fact that Denzel Ward made a play on fourth down. And guess what? If the Ravens went for two and got it, they still would have had to try to win the game eventually. If they didn't get it, or if they didn't do it at that point in time, they were still going to have to make a play in a dire situation, and they couldn't do it. Tyler Huntley couldn't connect with Hollywood Brown when he has a step on a defender downfield to put Justin Tucker in easy field goal range. Rashad Bateman couldn't make Denzel Ward miss. You know, they, they get sacked on second down and then Mark and you have to try to bail yourself out. Mark Andrews makes a great catch on second and tw- or third and 20 to make it fourth and convertible. So you need to do better earlier in those situations and you need to do better on those two point conversions. There has not been a ton of creativity in those, but uh, you know, the, the one that they end up running this time, you hear Tyler Huntley provide some clarity after the game and say that Greg Roman was basically expecting a man call. So they ran a man beating play with a sprint out with, uh, some levels to it and some some leverage, but the Browns played zone, so they lost that one, and you can chalk that one up to a bad call. If you want to be bad at Gre- mad at Greg Roman there, I think you can be mad at these calls that aren't working out there and uh, the lack of creativity maybe to use a Devin Duvernay or Rashad Bateman or uh, Mark Andrews or something, on you know, taking a wildcat snap or something. I don't know. Uh, something a little bit different that can give a different look and help alleviate some of this pressure, so. I think you can argue until you're blue in the face about the two-point conversion stuff. To me, it's pretty obvious, but the Ravens need to be better at actually converting these two-point conversions. Yeah, no, I agree. And honestly, the way that those Ravens teams you talked about, Spencer, has shown is they're going to want to win the game. They're going to they're gonna want to be aggressive. And honestly, I'm not so sure that if the Ravens get the first two-point conversion, if they score again with two seconds on the clock, I'm not sure they don't go for another one to try to win the game there. So it's all a matter of what they believe in, what their MO is, and what they've been showing for this entire season, and that is they believe in their players. They haven't had the results on the two-point conversions, as you talked about, but I do think that, you know, I, I was indifferent. You know, I, I kind of expected them to go for two just because of the aggressive nature of this team, so it didn't shock me. I wasn't necessarily upset with it. I was, again, it was like, all right, I understand why you're doing it because you want to understand where you are. Some people just... You know, it's understandable where the frustration comes from because you can make the argument, oh, how does the how does the Cleveland offense play? The Cleveland defense play if it's a one possession game there instead of two. But, you know, we'll never really I, know I think that's that. a little bit interesting, though, because the Ravens end up not getting it. So I think that's a dual edged sword because the Ravens don't get it. And then the Browns kind of try to run the clock out and aren't trying to score. They're trying to waste clock, which allowed the Ravens to come back and get the ball two more times and have a chance to win. So I, I think that that even logic flips on itself yet again. I I just, you know, you can argue about it all you want. They've got to be better in the end. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree. Ravens don't get it. They end up getting the ball back anyway with a chance to win, and they just they can't get the job done, unfortunately. We'll head into our first break, though. When we get back, we'll be diving into the Ravens' defense and the tale of two halves for them. So stay tuned for that, and we'll be right back. You listen to podcasts with the power of knowledge. You switch to Boost Mobile for the power of saving money. Because with Boost, you get the power of a free 5G phone so you can listen to all the latest episodes. The power of three unlimited data lines for 30 bucks a month per line so your family can harness all that brain power too. And the power of America's largest 5G networks. You can do it all on the speed of 5G. With all the money you'll save and all that knowledge you'll gain, just how powerful you become. Switch to Boost Mobile to find out. Get a free Samsung Galaxy A32 5G when you switch to one of America's largest 5G networks. More power to save. Boost Mobile. Free phone limited to customers and one per line. Additional restrictions apply. Offers covers not available everywhere or for all phones and networks. See BoostMobile.com for details. Super Bowl 56 at SoFi is less than 100 days away and on location. The official hospitality partner of the NFL is the only place to score a once-in-a-lifetime Super Bowl ticket and experience package. Select your exact seats and choose some elite experiences featuring an exclusive pregame celebration with NFL legends, five-star LA hotels, and food by the great Wolfgang Puck. Visit onlocationexp.com slash SB56 for more information or search Super Bowl on location. That's onlocationexp.com slash SB56 or search Super Bowl on location. We return here our second segment of this Taco Tuesday edition of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Ostrich, your host, still here with Spencer Schultz of Baltimore Beatdown. And Spencer, Baltimore losing 24 to 22. But the funny thing about it is the Browns went up in halftime 24-6. So the Browns did not score a point in the second half. The Ravens' defense came to play. Adjustments were made. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what those adjustments were. Because in this game, the Ravens <laughs> did not sack Baker Mayfield once. They had a couple of plays where they were close. Mayfield escaped or they missed a tackle here or there. But Spencer, to you, what were the key adjustments that the Ravens made on defense from the first half to the second half that allowed them to shut out this Cleveland offense? Well, I think the Browns established a lead and wanted to try and run the clock out a little bit. The Ravens defense continued to steadfast and 
bear down against the run. They've now hold Nick Chubb on the season in those two games played against the Browns to 25 carries for 75 yards. I think three runs of 10 yards total. So they absolutely suppressed the run game. The Browns pass game had some boots early on that were successful and they were trying to use misdirection and go left and right and do some different things. But uh, you know, they, they also had a few calls that didn't go their way. I, I usually am not one to cry about the refs or anything of that nature, but uh, Chris Westry early on Baker Mayfield severely underthrows, I believe uh, Dar- Jarvis Landry downfield. Chris Westry is in Landry's hip pocket, trying to turn back and make a play on the ball. And Landry kind of bear hugs Westry. Westry's caught up and the ref throws the flag for the Browns. And then Terry McCauley, who does the Sunday night football, uh, he's a former NFL head official and uh, does the Sunday night football officiating for the broadcast, uh, whatever the, officiating consultant, whatever it's called. And he said this clearly should have been offensive pass interference and didn't go that way. So they had a couple unlucky breaks. Uh, They dropped more interceptions than any team I can remember. Brandon Stevens on the tip drill drops it once, drops it a second time with a easy, you know, underhand carriage catch he could have made there and just can't let the football fall into his lap. But the Ravens tackled really well. They didn't get fooled by misdirection in the second half. I didn't see any major adjustments in terms of fronts or anything in the run game. The Ravens don't do anything too exotic with uh, their base fronts or anything of that nature, but they continue to close out, tackle well. Tyus Bowser made plays. They didn't let, you know, Baker Mayfield scramble for first downs. They took good angles and simply just played good football. They really did the entire game, uh, save a couple penalties. Like I mentioned, you know, the Browns uh, had one, I think, 34-yard pass. They only had two plays that were over 20 yards in that game. Of their 10 longest plays, five of them were under 14 yards. So the Ravens' defense really stifled the Browns uh, really the entire day, save a couple penalties and, you know, a touchdown here and there. But uh, they really only allowed 17 points. Seven of those points came on a strip sack where Miles Garrett picks it up. So uh, the Browns did a nice job converting in the red zone a couple times. Again, there's a pass interference on Tavon Young that gets the ball the way down to the one where Austin Hooper is just kind of flopping well before the ball even comes out and Tavon Young's not even touching him and he's throwing his arms up in the air. So uh, there's a little home cooking going on in Cleveland there, but uh, the the ball didn't lie in the end. The Ravens had a chance to win ultimately anyway, and the defense stepped up big time. They forced Baker Mayfield to have to move a lot and be great in the pocket and something that he struggled with. So uh, Baker Mayfield made a couple nice throws. They hit on some screens, a couple run plays, Dearness Johnson, things of that nature. But Ravens defense played a really nice game. They only allowed 17 points in this one. So I think that it was an outstanding performance. And Wink Martindale continues to prove that uh, kind of in the, the face of naysayers that it's best to stick with your scheme. You know, they, the guys that they bring in as backups, they're bringing them in to play in this scheme, not to play in someone else's scheme. They're not bringing them in to co- go play soft cover four off the ball and get picked apart methodically. They're still going to play aggressive. They're still going to press. They're still going to have their linebackers flying around. So I think that they remain true to who they were and played a really nice game. We saw some big tackles by Geno Stone and Chuck Clark and uh, Josh Bynes came up big quite a few times. I think Justin Matabike, uh, Justin Ellis, Brandon Williams, and Broderick Washington had a ton of nice plays against the run. So I think they were pretty consistent the entire day. They just didn't really get put in really bad field position in the second half. And uh, they were able to make a couple stops and force a couple field goals as well when they were put in some bad spots. So it was a, a nice day overall for the Wink Martindale's defense. I think he continues to show why he's one of the most well-respected coordinators in football. Yeah, and really ever since week 10, this defense has played phenomenal football. The miscommunications have been there. The the tackling has popped up a couple times, but it's been a lot better than what we saw earlier in the season. They were getting their feet under them, kind of adjusting to the Marcus Peters loss, and they've lost other guys too, Deshaun Elliott and Marlon Humphrey. But I think this defensive unit is a lot better than people do give it credit for at points because people look at the pass offense numbers and they say, oh, they're bottom five or bottom 10 in this category and that category. But I think they're doing their job. And for a Ravens team that's led by Lamar Jackson, you'd expect that, for example, in this game, and he, Jackson wasn't in this game for most of it, but, you know, 17 points given up by the defense. You'd expect the Ravens offense to score at least over 17 or over 24, but it just hasn't been the case. The offense has been struggling, and so it reflects a little bit more poorly on the defense because they're not winning the games that maybe they could if the offense put up a couple more points. But Spencer, you talked about some of the defensive linemen, those depth pieces such as Justin Matabike, Project Washington. Well, Clayus Campbell leaves this game in week 14 a bit early, in fact, very early, with another injury. And he, look, he's been playing great football this season. And if he's out for however long with this recording, we don't really know at this point. But for however long he is out, whether it's a week or two weeks, or hopefully he plays next week, but 
How confident are you in those depth pieces? The team is already without Derek Wolf. He's not going to come back this year. Justin Matabike, Roger Washington, Brandon Williams, Justin Ellis. How confident are you in those guys to pick up the slack with Campbell out? Well, I don't really think Brandon Williams uh, has much upside as a pass rusher, but he definitely had to have been playing hurt for a while. He had to get shelf because of that shoulder comes back and he's done a great job controlling the center in the run game, uh, doing what they paid him to do finally again. So He's started to play really well, control the A-gap, and be able to make some plays. They get 11 tackles against the Steelers, which for a nose tackle speaks a lot of volume. Uh, so I think that he's done a nice job. Justin Ellis has been a really pleasant surprise this year, consistently played at a high level and made some plays nonstop. So uh, Justin Matabike, I don't think, has really looked at as a depth guy, a third-round pick, a guy that I actually had a top 50 grade on in that draft. I was a little surprised to see him slide that far, but continues to be a real bad matchup problem against the Browns, able to get really good penetration against them, lock out. He's won quite a few reps against Wyatt Teller, who's considered one of, if not the best guards in football right now. So uh, they did a great job. Those outside linebackers as well are doing a great job in the run game, but I think that we're watching Broderick Washington really come into his own in the system and be able to stack and shed and have really good awareness off of the first step where the play is intended and where he needs to mirror and how to beat guys to different spots. So I know that we heard John Harbaugh have some really high comments of him as well. So I think they've got a nice rotation going on up front. We'll see what happens with Calais Campbell. Uh, being as the Packers are an NFC game, you know, of course you need to win a game and a win would go far away in the standings. A win always helps. But when it comes to the tiebreakers, the losing a game in the NFC is preferred because the tiebreakers go head to head division, then conference. So losing to the Packers, if you're going to lose any of those games, if you need to rest a Lamar Jackson or a Calais Campbell and want to have, try to have them healthy against the Bengals for a, another bloodbath in the AFC North. And that's not a bad idea, but they've showed that they can shut down the run pretty effectively, at least against the Browns without Campbell, which was a big surprise for me two weeks ago or yeah, two weeks ago when they played the Browns, I thought that Nick Chubb was going to have his way with the Ravens and the Browns offensive line that features, you know, small pros, some first round picks and some really highly regarded players. It's going to be able to have their way. And that just hasn't been the case. The Ravens have one of, if not the best run defenses in the NFL. And while they haven't had a ton of pass rush, we do see Matabike di disrupting. He struggled to be a closer or a finisher when he gets close to the quarterback, but a lot of pressures. I think he had four pressures in this game. He's recorded four 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 pressure games in the last six games, I believe now. So really starting to get after the quarterback just needs to uh, disengage a little quicker and go drag some quarterbacks down and finish and grab those sacks. And that'll help kill some more drives. So this unit's playing some really good football. They're not getting bullied at all whatsoever. They're winning the line of scrimmage consistently. You're seeing Josh Bynes and Patrick Queen be able to play a little bit more freely, come flow downhill and go end plays, as well as guys like Odafe away, Justin Houston, Tyus Bowers have been putting in dents into the you know C gaps and D gaps and really able to hold that edge. So the Ravens run game, uh, run defense has been really impressive. And of course you want to see a little better pass rush. It's going to be tough to sack Aaron Rodgers, who knows how to, you know, be a magician and uh, get the ball out early, get the ball away and, and rolls out really effectively Has great ball fakes and knows when to throw the ball away. But the Ravens are going to have to find a way to get pressure on Aaron Rodgers and to drag him to the ground and stall out some Packers drives. And I think that it's a big time for a big opportunity for Justin Matabike and Broderick Washington to go make plays against the pass, especially when the uh, Packers are going to go use some of their heavier personnel and look like they're going to run the ball, run some boots and some play actions off of it. They need to go finish. Yeah. And one of the better things you can do as a defense is make an offense one dimensional. And so if the Ravens defensive line unit, the front seven, the defense can stop Aaron Jones and, and all these Packers run threats, then I think that if you can force Aaron Rodgers to throw, obviously Rodgers and Devontae Adams, they have a good pass offense, but if you can limit the run game, you can learn what to expect there, and I think it could be a good thing for this Ravens defense. In Week 15 against Green Bay, but we'll head into our final break. When we get back, we'll talk a bit more about that Week 15 matchup between the Ravens and the Browns, so stay tuned. For, well, the Ravens and the Packers, excuse me, so stay tuned for that, and we'll be right back. There's been a lot of talk about Stance Apparel lately, especially because they just launched a new line of active apparel, plus this holiday gifting time and Stance is the coolest gift you can give. Sure how incredibly comfortable and well-made their socks, shirts, joggers, and hoodies are. And there's so many things that they have from those boring old socks and underwear that you have. Stance has a ton of different things to look at. Founded in 2009, Stance Apparel represents a radical reinvention of socks, underwear, and active apparel with a sharp focus on comfort, quality, and creativity. Stance brings an atypical aesthetic alongside some of pop culture's hottest collaborators for the ultimate in style and self-expression because everything you wear should be a direct extension of who you are and how you feel. Stance believes that the perfect fit matters more than fitting in. 
that those who feel good do good. So go see for yourself. Register for an account at stance.com and get 15% off of your first purchase. Use promo code locked on to check out to apply. Enjoy the color and comfort of life less ordinary with stance. We return here. Our final segment of this Tuesday edition of Lockdown Ravens. Kevin Ostrecker is still here with Spencer Schultz. And Spencer, coming off of two straight losses, the Ravens will now come home, play the Green Bay Packers in Week 15. Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Jones, Devontae Adams, that very high-powered Green Bay offense. You kind of alluded to it a bit in the second segment there. But do you feel like this is a game, you know, and obviously a lot depends on Lamar Jackson's status, Clays Campbell as well, and a few other guys. But do you think this is a game that the Ravens can realistically win? Or do you think that the Ravens could be looking at their third straight loss here? I think the Ravens are going to be looking at their third straight loss in this one, depending on how injury reports go and things of that nature. Aaron Rodgers did speak about how his toe is getting to a pretty bad situation there and uh, surgery might be in the cards. So let's say if the Arizona Cardinals are able to win tonight and uh, the, the Packers don't feel like they you know, can secure that one seat or something, then uh, who knows, man? Any Anything can happen. The Packers offensive line has been almost as big of an issue at times as the Ravens has, but uh, Aaron Rodgers has been able to negate that and get the ball out quickly. So I, I don't think the Ravens, especially who I don't really anticipate Lamar Jackson being able to play. I think it would be a little surprising and almost a little bit negligent, especially considering that this is not the most important game of the four remaining. Uh, you, you can kind of afford to lose this one. And this is one where you look at your schedule and say, oh, well, the Packers are coming to town. That's going to be a tough one. So uh, ma- mainly this Packers defense is playing some really good football. I know that they didn't against the Bears, a divisional opponent. Uh, so I'd throw that one out a little bit. But Devondre Campbell has been a, a menace. Jair Alexander getting healthy again. They got Amos on the back end, Darnell Savage. And uh, they got some, you know, uh, some real players in that front four, even without Zadaria Smith, who has not been activated yet. But uh, they've, they've got Kenny Clark and uh, some, some real nasty dudes, Rashawn Gary. So I, I just think beating Aaron Rodgers takes a pretty perfect game a lot of the time. It's rare to see. Uh, how, you know, even if he's a little banged up, we'll see what happens with that. But it's rare to see Aaron Rodgers uh, be able to lose. I would anticipate the Ravens do everything they can to try and force the ball out early and make make it so that Devontae Adams can't really beat you that way. And I would anticipate the Packers trying to use guys like Alan Lazard or uh, Robert Tun. Or actually, Robert Tunyon's out now, so never mind. But uh, watching you know Aaron Jones be utilized in the past game and force them to tackle in the open field, I, I don't know if this is going to be a blowout or not, but. Uh, I'm not betting against Aaron Rodgers to lose games or betting on him to lose games very often. And I think Tyler Huntley's got a lot of moxie, but if I, if Lamar doesn't play or Lamar's not able to really practice this week and isn't hundred percent healthy and they trot him out there, which again, I think, you know, might not be ideal, but uh, I just don't see Tyler Huntley being able to outduel Aaron Rodgers in this situation. And the Packers are a damn good football team. The only real downside they have is that they have maybe the worst special teams in the last five years. They make mistakes time and time again. So if the Ravens, who are a top two or three special teams consistently every single year, are able to go take advantage, block a punt, block a kick, uh, get a return going, do some things, and then play a little bit better than the Bears played the other night in the second half and uh, able to get something going maybe in the first half with a big return and control the ball a little bit, then then we could be talking about a close game and maybe a Ravens win. But ultimately, I do think the Packers are going to take this one. Yeah, for now, I'm on board with you there, Spencer. I think that... You know, the Ravens do take a loss here, and, you know, there's a lot of week left. So, obviously, there's still a lot to learn about the injury reports for both teams and who's in, who's out, who's practicing, who's not. But I think that for the Ravens, the key in this game is going to be not following the script they have followed on offense, which has been the slow starts. If they can get off to a fast start, get momentum early, we've seen what this team can do with momentum early. We just haven't seen it recently. It's been a very long time since the Ravens have scored a first quarter touchdown since week six. It's about 115 minutes consecutively in first quarter action that they have not put the ball in the end zone in the first quarter. So if they can do that, I think that anything is possible. But at the same time, I agree it is very hard to bet against Aaron Rodgers. And again, all the high powered pieces on that offense, the defense that they have. I don't think it's impossible for the Ravens to win this one. I definitely don't think that, but. I think that this could be their third straight loss and one that I agree with you, Spencer. I'd rather have them lose this game as opposed to Cincinnati or as opposed to Pittsburgh, because those are the most important games remaining. You have the Rams coming to town in week 17. That's another one that's an NFC opponent where you don't necessarily have to say this is going to make or break our season. The win is important, as you talked about. But I think that if the Ravens do drop a game to Green Bay or a game to Los Angeles or both even, If the Ravens win their final two divisional games, then I think that'll put them in very good shape to make the playoffs or even win this division, which is still very much in the realm of possibility. But Spencer, that's all I have for you here today. 
Thank you so much for joining me once again. Hopefully we'll be talking next week and the Ravens will have pulled out a victory against a very talented Green Bay team. What's on the back of you this week as the Ravens head into that matchup? Going to be doing Watch It Wednesday, going over the uh, the All-22 tape, looking through that, looking at the film, looking at what we can take away and what we might see moving forward. Probably going to look at tempo and some of the things Rashad Bateman did as well as what this Ravens defensive front was able to do in limiting Nick Chubb and uh, continuing to stuff this Browns offense. So I'll be on there. I'll be publish- publishing articles on BaltimoreBeatdown.com, on Twitter, at Ravens for Dummies. All that good stuff as usual. You guys know where to find me. Thank you so much for having me on, Kevin. Listeners of the show, make sure to go give Kevin five stars, share this podcast with a friend, and reward the man who gives you the best daily Ravens coverage. Thanks so much, and I'll talk to you guys next Tuesday. Thanks so much, Spencer. Be sure to check out Spencer's work. I promise it'll be worth it. He has a vast knowledge of the game of football. He just heard here for about 35 minutes, but that's all I have for you today here on Locked on Ravens. When we get back here tomorrow, we'll be answering your mailbag questions, so stay tuned for that, and I will see you tomorrow.